I was recently asked a question in a one-on-one -on -one lesson I was teaching that completely baffled me. She said, Christy, how do I know when I'm no longer a beginner at this watercolor thing? And so I was scrambling in my embarrassment and I'm hoping she didn't notice because I really didn't know how to answer this question and I've been painting for over 30 years. And so I came off with a collected and calm answer that seemed to make sense, something along the lines of, when you've practiced all the techniques and you feel like you're proficient in all of them, then you can combine them successfully and predictably. But I immediately was not happy with my answer. So in today's video, we're gonna go a little bit further and I'm gonna explain to you and teach you the next steps as a X watercolor beginner because today I'm a lot more collected and I have a much better answer for you. And better yet, I have some really fun painting, drills, exercises, whatever you wanna call them. They're fun, that's all that matters. That you can do as you enter into and really dig into this next level of your watercolor painting journey. Let's go back to kindergarten. The time when milestones and a sense of traveling through certain steps to proficiency first enters our consciousness. Most of our learning at this point is done through play, but quickly we enter first grade and everything changes. Proficiencies are now at the core of learning and play is traded for worksheets, drills, and this first grade trajectory continues into our adult learning lives. Very, very quickly we forget how to play. And so when we challenge ourselves to go back to play as adults, I venture to say this is when we're no longer beginners. We're now ex-beginners. But don't go anywhere because it's not that simple. Moving beyond being a watercolor beginner is really simply about playfulness with the core techniques that we learned in the video I'm linking below. It's about challenging yourself to put a spin on what you've learned, on what has now come to feel comfortable. For today's supplies, you're gonna need your favorite watercolor paper. I'm using Arches Cold Press. Your favorite palette, at least 12 colors I'd suggest, but if you don't have 12, that's fine. And of course, a favorite brush or even a handful of favorite brushes. I'm gonna be using quite a few from my two collections of brushes available. I'm going to be taking you through each of the techniques that I covered in the mastermind video that I've linked below and showing you how to put a spin on them based on three factors, wet on dry, wet on wet, and opacity. And then at the end, we're gonna paint the same exact painting we did in the video I've linked below, but we're going to use all of the new technique spins that we've just learned. Let's get to some practice drills. Here we go, friends. I'm just adding some clean water to this section of the chart. And friends, this is a simple chart. I didn't measure. It's just, just do your thing and have five columns. All right, laying some color down. I chose blue, no particular reason. I just like the blue. And we're gonna then choose a different color after rinsing our brush and immediately start to look at some of the differences that happen when we're using the wet on wet technique or wow, with two different colors. And then rinse your brush again and choose a third color. Friends, what I want you to understand here is that wet on wet, when we first learn, it's more about the wet paper and one color and seeing what happens and then slowly starting to add a second color or more. But what I really want you to do as an intermediate, as an ex beginner, is understand what starts to happen when you get more than two, three plus colors on the page because it's a lot of magic. The other thing I want you to take notice of and really remember is what starts to happen when earlier parts of your painting start to dry. So the wet on wet areas that were first wet start to dry, but you're still adding color to them or at least the perimeters. And you're gonna get a lot of interesting things happening, like I like to say, in the margins. So I want you to notice that as well. So again, as you go through this exercise, I want you to notice a bunch of things about this wet on wet with various colors. I want you to notice how the page is drying and how those different levels of dryness on the page are affecting the way that the color is soaking into the paper. What's happening in the overlaps when there's a really wet on wet on wet area or when there's a wet on damp area, like what's going on there? Is the color exploding more? And then when everything's dry, I want you to just take that last look and evaluate and kind of burn it into your memory. 
because you can come back and use some of the things that you learned. So for example, look at some of the interesting things that are happening when I'm adding some more of the opaque watercolor here at the top over that ivory and the blue, that peach is just creating some interesting mixtures and I can't wait to see what it looks like when it's completely dry. All right, friends, moving on to wet on dry and I'm gonna be using a watercolor sketching technique. Because the thing is, it's not just a certain type of stroke. We see a lot of those medium width, leafy strokes, you know, my press dragon lift type of strokes. I've got a video linked below if you wanna know more about that. But strokes come in all different shapes and sizes. And I think sometimes as a beginner, we forget that. But as an X beginner, you start to really explore what your brush can do. So then you need to think about what can the brush do? For example, here I'm using a liner brush and I'm going wet on dry and I'm literally using my brush to sketch. So what can your brush do when you combine it with some interesting technique combos? And this is what happens. So I'm literally just forcing myself. I keep saying literally a lot. I don't know why. You know what I'm doing. I'm literally, no, I'm kidding. But seriously, use the liner brush to sketch. Pretend you're holding a pencil. It's just the kind of pencil that you have to reload with paint and water every so often. And see what happens. Change up your pressure. Do this wet on dry. You could even make another section of this column and do the same technique wet on wet and see what happens. But I want you to start thinking about your watercolor brush as a pencil and how you would use it differently if you were thinking about making linear strokes that bounce along the page, that flow along the page continuously instead of making thicker strokes that are just kind of a press, a little bit of drag and lift. How can that change? How can that evolve? what you've been doing so far in your journey, how can you take this new combination of techniques and let it propel you to the next level? You're seeing a lot of texture here, friends, a lot of whimsy. And so again, take note of that and think to yourself, where could I have used this in a painting maybe that you worked on a week ago or a month ago? Maybe even go back to that painting, friends, and add some of this kind of detailing and see how it feels. Now, as an X beginner or entering into the intermediate phase, because I know we like to put names on things and titles on things, you really start to think about the overlapping of techniques. You stop seeing these watercolor techniques as standalones and you start seeing them as part of an equation, sometimes part of a very long and somewhat complicated equation. And I can tell you from experience, when you start to see your watercolor techniques that way and you pair that with different brushes and different ways to hold your brushes, oh my gosh, the floodgates of opportunity open wide. Next up, friends, we are looking at the flooding technique. It's one that I named. So we're gonna start by laying some color down and we're gonna look at this technique with flooding on dry paper and then flooding on wet paper. Because remember, we wanna see all the different facets or personalities of these single techniques that we've been using up until now. So lay down some color. I'm choosing the emerald green from my Art for Joy's Sake palette and then immediately start pushing or flooding that emerald green area with, I chose a fluorescent yellow. And see what happens when you push some of that color around, when you force some friction onto the page, does it stain the page? And remember, we started on a dry page, so the color is gonna be more intense than if we tried this or started this on a wet page. And we'll see soon what happens when you do some flooding on a wet page. Continue on adding more colors, change up the color family. Right now I've got cool colors, you could go warm. I'm actually experimenting with bringing in some opaques to see what happens. Flooding, you'll immediately now notice, it's a way of mixing color on the page instead of mixing it in the mixing tray on your palette. Take note of the intensity, take note of how the colors start to interact when you push them together instead of maybe what you're used to, which is stroking them side by side and maybe touching in areas and letting those areas bleed. All right, I'm gonna head right below here with a clean brush full of water and I'm gonna wet the area to get ready for our next experiment. 
I'm going to start by laying down some red. Now this red from my palette is a highly staining red and so we'll see how it does with the flooding wet on wet. And of course, as expected, that red is juicy and saturated and rich. It's gorgeous. Let's go in now and flood in some of this bright pink. Gorgeous. You can immediately see the difference. Now I'm using a more bold color than I did with my flood on dry. So overall, the look is more bold, but you can see the way the colors kind of flood and puddle together is very differently because I started with a damp or wet page. Go ahead and add some opaque watercolor. I'm using this like soft shell pink from my collection. And again, just seeing how I'm almost creating kind of a puddle on the page now and the colors are acting completely different than when I used the same type of motion and the same pushing around of color as I did earlier with the flood on dry. Okay, take a breath here and make note of how the changes are different, how the way that the pigments kind of change and mingle and evolve with one another are different from the flood on dry to the flood on wet. And you know what? You've made these charts. These are yours. Go ahead if you want and make some notes directly on the charts. I highly recommend keeping these, even if you have an area for inspiration, some type of board in your space where you create, pin them up for a while so you can definitely use them as reference. What I'm noticing most, the difference here, the flood on dry, is actually more of a subtle transition from one color to another, even though I use the same type of friction and the same type of movement with my brush. So surprisingly, the flood on wet is much juicier, much bolder, because all of the puddles that are being created, it almost looks slightly like marbling, which is so cool. These are the kind of discoveries that you start to unearth as you really continue in your watercolor journey. And also, these are the kind of experiences that you start to log into your intuition. It's not like you're taking notes and being like, I've got to use that intersection of red and purple in my next. No, I mean, you could do that. Maybe we've got some planners here. I mean, I do talk about our procrastination personalities. I'll link that video below. And one of them is a planner. But most of us are going to just enter and log all of this new juicy information into our intuition, especially as we start and continue to use these new technique combinations day in and day out. I gotta ask, who's excited? Because I certainly am. It can be so helpful to do charts like this, don't you think? That really kind of log unique experiences. And then once you've got the chart done once, you can move on to the fun stuff, meaning the actual painting of the paintings. All right, let me know if you agree. If you're having a good time, if you're finding value in this, head to comments and find a way, whatever way you wanna express that you're loving this. And uh, I can't wait to see the comment section for this video. And while you're at it, go ahead and give this video a boop. Friends, that's a like. And it's just that little thumbs up button. And you know what? It really helps out my channel in so many different ways. I appreciate it so, so much. All right, we are moving on to the ombre technique. And the same thing, we're gonna look at ombre on dry, ombre on wet, and then bringing in some different levels of opacity with our watercolors. Remember, we're looking at three different details when it comes to these more advanced techniques. Wet on dry, wet on wet, and opacity. My self-named technique of ombre is what's traditionally known as pulling. But what I'm about to do here definitely makes it a new technique because I am going right onto a dry page. And usually pooling involves a very damp kind of environment. So grabbing that pink and then immediately going to the peach right underneath and the friction of adding the peach just overlapping with the pink starts to blend them together. And then I'm gonna continue down with a bright pink. And you'll notice you've got a soft-ish transition between these colors, but it's not super flowy and it's not as soft as a traditional ombre where you use quite a bit more water but I can imagine so many ways that this ombre effect on dry paper could be so incredibly helpful in different painting situations I've been in. 
How about you? Can you think of ways that the ombre on dry technique might be really, really helpful? Let us know in comments. Heading into the ombre on wet, and of course, I'm going and wetting the page first with super clean water, and I'm going to go ahead with the same colors, the peach, then the pink, or actually, I think I switched it up, but close enough, and continue on with the bright pink, and let's see the difference. You can already see the difference here. The transitions are more gradual. They're softer and dreamier. Even with the more intense pink, the transition is a lot more flowy and kind of romantic. Going in with that ivory again, and then of course with the blue. So the differences are definitely more subtle in this particular example, but friends, I'd have to say they're not subtle enough that they don't matter. You can see the soft qualities of the ombre on wet that just aren't as obvious in the ombre on dry. Imagine this, you could start with an ombre on dry, that layer could dry, then you could glaze over top with an ombre on wet. And oh my gosh, did I just blow your mind because I said a lot of words. Be sure to stick around because we're gonna be covering glazing really soon. Heading into the lifting technique, friends, and here's what I'm gonna do to start this off. I'm gonna paint two leaves. You can paint your leaves any which way you want. Just the kind of rule of thumb for this particular exercise is make sure there's a couple different colors going on and maybe make sure that the colors like are kind of punchy. I'm using reds and greens and yellows, so there's some opposite color wheel stuff going on. And then let those leaves dry for maybe a minute. Traditionally, we think of lifting as a way to correct mistakes. I want to talk about the idea of positive lifting, where the lifting isn't necessarily to remove something because it's wrong, that the lifting is done to actually reveal something really interesting, really cool, really exciting and evocative in your painting. Let me explain. Better yet, watch what's happening on the page as I'm starting to lift some of that darker emerald green from the underside of that bigger leaf. It's revealing really subtle but obvious textures. And then after that lifting is done, I go ahead right in with that medium olive green from my palette right over top. I glaze it right over top. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about glazing. Basically, I add a layer. And look at what happens. Some of those interesting textures that revealed themselves when I did the positive lifting are now even more obvious and even more exciting because I added a glaze of color over top. So I also call this push and pull, positive lifting. Push and pull because you push color onto the page, but then you pull it back off to see what color stained the page, what color remained when you pulled most of it off, and what that color did to kind of change the composition or the texture of the paper underneath. It can be really interesting, especially if you lay down some highly staining colors, like the red in my palette here. It's staining, it's hard to remove the color once it's down, but when you do remove some of it, some of the most incredible textures reveal themselves. You can see what I'm doing here. It's just so gorgeous. Let's just take a look at the red that I added initially when I created this leaf. I'm lifting it off and it's creating the most lovely velvety peachiness that I haven't seen in a while. I'm pretty excited about it, honestly, as I do this. And then immediately, my surface is now damp, so I can immediately go in and take advantage of that dampness and add some watercolor sketching over top with the tip of my brush in a contrasting color. And I'm gonna see what happens when those two techniques mingle together. Friends, this is the heart and soul of what I'm talking about. When you're an ex-beginner, you start to really explore these intersections and really figure out what they mean for establishing your own style and your own painting sensibilities. Lots of push and pull here happening. I just pushed some additional red there on the left-hand side of that bigger leaf just to see what would happen when all of those layers start mingling together. It's super fun. I'm, I'm not sad about it. Going down into this smaller leaf and doing some of the positive lifting. I don't feel like I have a mistake here. I'm not trying to remove something because it's too heavy or ill-placed. I just want to see what texture is happening underneath, what, what the staining did. Look at that. It's so gorgeous. And of course, it's a great way to add highlights. We know that. We get that. 
but it's also a really cool way to start playing with texture and pattern. And it's another way to look at your composition. It's just another level of interest that you can control. Okay, friends, head into comments and let me know which of these technique spins so far is your favorite. Is it the multi-color wash in the wet on wet section, the wet on dry with watercolor sketching? Is it the flooding on dry or the flooding on wet, the ombre on dry or wet? Or is it the positive lifting? I'm gonna tell you what, uh, it's the positive lifting for me. I can't handle it. And I know I'm probably gonna get some backlash because I have a thing for uh, kind of naming my techniques, things that I've come up with. And really my techniques are a lot of combinations of existing techniques out in the watercolor world. But I find that giving them a name helps us organize them in our brain and therefore makes it easier for us to use them in our daily art journey. So don't go too hard on me. Really, I'm just a creative weirdo and I like to talk a lot. So, you know, I am what I am. But moving on friends to the next batch of techniques that we need to put a twist on. And stick around because I'm gonna be painting a full composition using all of these techniques, but I'm excited because I'm gonna compare it to the same composition I painted in the watercolor beginners video that I've linked below. It's gonna be a really cool comparison. All right, friends, we've got two more classic techniques that we're gonna put a spin on scrubbing and line work, and then we're gonna move on to additional techniques that are more advanced glazing and contrast detailing. Let's get into it. So basically scrubbing is a way that you kind of dab and dash and scrub and scratch your brush across the surface of the paper as a way to add color. And of course, as you can imagine, it reveals a ton of texture. So I'm gonna start by adding some opaque scrubs. This is the ivory watercolor from my set and it by nature is very opaque and it just has beautiful coverage, very velvety. And I'm gonna bring in another more opaque color from my palette, the peach. I know it looks like I'm beating up on my brush, but I promise I'm not. I'm using about a medium pressure. I immediately notice that because I'm using a more opaque watercolor, I'm getting a lot more coverage than I would expect with this scrubbing technique, even though I don't have a ton of water on my brush. Let's move on with a clean brush to a more sheer traditional watercolor pigment and use the same technique. And I've got a very similar amount of water on my brush. And as you can see, I'm getting a lot more texture. I probably had a bit more water on my brush for the first opaque exercise in this section, but the difference is not that big. But the visual difference is huge. Now, moving on to scrubbing on wet. And of course, I wet my page first. And I'm going right in with this emerald green. And you can immediately see the difference. It's very similar to the effect of the opaque watercolor, but with the sheerness of a traditional pigment. And I really love the three different kind of looks that we're getting here. I think this is so powerful and holds so much promise for your future paintings. All right, let me know, do, do you feel the same? Do you feel like there's a lot of opportunity in this particular column so far? Let me know in comments. And while you're at it, go ahead, give the video a boop, that's a like. And you know what, if you wanna not miss any of my videos upcoming, you wanna hit that little bell icon as well, cause that'll make sure that you get a notification whenever I post a new video. Moving on to line work, another classic technique, but I'm gonna explore it three different ways using my quarter inch dagger brush. I'm gonna create a really simple kind of sketchy landscape here and with my opaque pigments, of course, just so you can see the crispness of the lines and see the coverage when you really start to explore these classic techniques, but with some non-traditional pigment or paint characteristics. What I love about more opaque watercolors is I feel like you get the best of both worlds with watercolor. There's moments, especially when you have more water on your brush where it feels like traditional watercolor, but somehow creamier still. But then when you have that kind of 50-50 ratio of color to water, you get that beautiful heavy coverage, great for detailing, great for bold shadows. So I just feel like really exploring all these techniques with a different kind of personality, 
of watercolor pigment is so beneficial, so powerful. Now, I also think it's really important for you to start thinking about line work a little differently. It's not just about those thin, flowy, lyrical lines. It's about the different types of lines you can make with all variety of brushes. So it's gonna be thick lines and medium lines and undulating lines. And it's not always gonna be flowy and lyrical and romantic. Sometimes it's gonna be bold and scratchy and staccato. So this is the time to really start exploring what line work means within your own work. And honestly, trying out a lot of different options. And you may not use them all down the road, but just knowing that there's so many options out there can really help propel your artwork on this journey. All right, rinsing my brush and loading up with a more traditional sheer watercolor personality. And I'm just gonna sketch a little bloom with the tip of this number six round brush, friends. And I think it's important to switch up your brushes as you're experimenting with these exercises. It's just you know, there's just all sorts of learning and layers and we're compounding all of our knowledge here today. So yeah, just, just go for it. And as you can see, the beauty of, and the sheerness of a traditional watercolor are shining bright here. You can see through to the paper. You can see the kind of immediate and instant lights and darks that happen. This is what you would expect out of traditional watercolor. If you've been around here for a hot minute, you know that traditionally when I'm speaking of the line work technique, I'm using a liner brush. It's the long and skinny one. And I like to make super delicate, whimsical, romantic, lyrical, all the adjectives type of stroke with that brush. But that's not all there is to line work. And that is exactly the kind of reason we are here today. Now let's move on to line work on wet. Because, oh my gosh, this one, this one is going to probably become your favorite. Wet down that paper and let's get into it. This time around, I'm using a filbert brush and I'm just gonna start adding some strokes of whatever color. I'm feeling like greens and blues, you do you, boo. All right, and just start adding some press and lift, press and lift, and that lift is quick. And you're gonna get these gorgeous ocean wavy like marks and they're going to be softly diffused like you can see here there the diffusion is just so delicate and soft but the stroke and the color intensity is really bold oh my gosh there's so many uses for this you could use this in an ocean scene of course but think about going even lighter watering down your color and using the same strokes for a background heavens to betsy i can't even handle my excitement with this one are you with me are you with me friends this is a good one. I'm using kind of an S curve also, that kind of stroke where you make a really soft graduated S. I gotta tell you, this could be a whole exercise. This could be like a meditation. Fill a whole damp page with these kind of strokes and woo, I, I just, I, I gotta stop. We gotta move on because I'm gonna lose it in a very good way. <laughs> I just wanna remind you again, these are your charts, you own this space. Feel free to take some notes, things that you're kind of noticing, things that you don't wanna forget, this is your space to do it. And this is also the time to do it because all of the excitement is fresh. And that's when your response to what you're doing is gonna be the most uh, accurate and the most excited and yeah. All right, let's talk about glazing. I've actually done a few videos on this channel about this technique. I'm gonna link them below, but I thought that glazing deserved a real technical moment here. So in preparation for the section, I'm gonna go ahead and just add a bunch of interesting weirdo strokes to this column. You do you, you can copy me, let's speed through this, and also you wanna let these dry. So let's get on with it. Because the idea of glazing is that we add layers of color and or texture in between a time of drying of those layers. And so, yeah, imagine what we're about to do. Woo, friends, I feel like we need a hot minute to recover from that glazing excitement, but it is time to move on to contrast detailing. Here's the thing, I'm gonna use a number 12 round brush, use what you have, use what you love, and I'm going to just paint some classic press, drag, and lift leaves. Paint the leaves the way you're comfortable painting them. That's not the important part. Get those leaves down, feel free to follow my little like micro composition here or just do your thing. 
But the point is, is to have these leaves be pigmented enough and still damp or wet enough so that when you finish this up, they're still damp and wet enough because we're gonna be using that to our advantage with this particular technique. This technique starts out as wet on dry. And then when I get my leaves going here, I'm gonna to start to add a little bit of color to the edge, right where the wet edge meets the dry of the paper, right on that line. It's gonna feel like an outline when you start, but you're not gonna do it continuous around the whole silhouette. And then you're gonna take your rinsed brush that's damp and make a stroke right down next to that color that you added. And that's basically gonna create the most delicious blendy blend, like I did in that first one. And I created this gorgeous blendy blend from a red into the olive green all the way over to the emerald green. And let's do it again here on this second middle leaf. Look at what's happening. Dot in a little bit of color, dot in a little bit of darkness. I Like I did at the top where it was just a darker green. At the bottom, I did a bold red. Just for example sake, I'm gonna continue it down here, a few dabs and dots of a dark green onto that lighter green leaf, and then go right next door with a damp, clean brush and blendy blend. And that, my friends, is what I call contrast detailing. Yes, it's another made up technique by yours truly. Go easy on me. Friends, this technique is going to be your BFF. I just have a feeling. It's a wonderful way to number one, add really quick depth and dimension or really quick shadows. Now let's head back to the glazing section now that everything's had some time to dry. Just to give you an idea, this page of mine has actually dried for about five days, not intentionally, and certainly not because you need to dry each layer in between for five days, but that's just when I finally got back to it. But I will say this, the longer you let each layer dry, the less disruption you'll see when you add a new layer on top of the old layer. All right, let's get into it. So for this exercise, really we're just going to start laying some additional layers of color over top what we already have. Few things I want you to notice, and you can start then to think about how this would translate into a real life painting. What happens with the undercolor, the first layer, when you apply a new layer of color? So I'm starting here at the top with this peach from the Art for Joy Sake palette. It's definitely opaque and you can see it obscures some of the pink, going right next door with some lines like a rusty red color and then a big stroke to like fan that color out and spread it out again on top of that original pink. And then let's go in with some creamy ivory and a little bit of fluorescent yellow on the end here and blend that back into that rusty red color where you can still see just a hint of the pink shining through. You can imagine the practical applications of what I just showed you here in a real painting. Mind blowing, love glazing. Glazing adds depth, but not in always a traditional way. I love adding unexpected color, like this reddish tone on top of the green, glazing that red over top of the original green of this leafy shape that I created, and then going ahead and blending it in, and then bringing back some of the stronger green from my palette, glazing that over top of the original yellowy green. And look at that, it's so interesting. So don't don't think of glazing in just the traditional way. I want you to think of it a little differently here, like how I'm adding this really sheer, sheer green over top of the pink in that top area that I was first working in. Such an interesting combination where you kind of are muting that pink because of the thin glaze of green that you're adding over top. So move away from just thinking about, okay, I can strengthen an existing color with just a darker shade of that color as the only way to glaze. I want you to think about color theory and opposites and how glazing opposite colors on the color wheel on top of one another can really just level up your painting experience in a big way. If you're curious to learn more about color theory and how it impacts your everyday painting, I'm going to link my video about color theory below. All right, look here, friends. I'm going over top of the blue, glazing on top with some purple and some red, but I'm not glazing the whole area in the same way. So this is another detail to think about with glazing. Often when you think about traditional glazing, you think about glazing the whole area. So if you painted a leaf, let's say, as your first layer, you're going to cover that whole leaf 
with another color or a vast majority of that leaf. That is my understanding of traditional glazing. I like to think of glazing a little different and adding strokes of additional color in some areas, like this green leaf here that I'm now adding pink and more intense olive green to, but I'm doing it in brush strokes and allowing kind of the gradient glazing effect to shine through, finishing off with a yellowy green to really bring this leaf to life. And then, yeah, I needed to add something really bold, so an emerald green right there on the underside. This is all glazing. And this is really an interesting place to think about the intersection of techniques, which is the whole idea of going from a beginner watercolors to a more intermediate watercolor, as I mentioned it earlier, we think about how these techniques intersect. So we've got kind of line quality, linear detail, the technique that I love, I talk about a lot on this channel, and we're intersecting that with glazing. So glazing isn't just about adding big strokes of color, big fields of color over top of an original layer, it's about adding strokes of additional color over an original layer of watercolor. Thirdly, I want you to think about, of course, opacity. We've been talking a lot about the many facets or personalities of watercolor, and it's something you're really gonna pay attention to as you enter into the intermediate phase of your watercolor journey. And now I'm adding some more opaque layers, glazing some more opaque pigment onto a more sheer pigment of my original layer. And that just adds a whole new dimension of excitement. And now I'm just going at it, friends. I'm going back to the top, adding a third layer, another glazing layer of purple here on the left-hand side of that pink area, and then pulling some of the color off with the lifting technique. Remember, it's all about the intersection of these techniques. I've just intersected three techniques, and that's where things get really interesting, really exciting. How are we feeling about glazing? Do you think it's gonna really elevate your painting journey? Let me know in comments. Just say yes, or if you have a question about glazing, get that in the comments below as well. Moving on to a real painting. We're gonna use all of these techniques in a actual composition. And as I go through this painting, I am going to have the techniques that I'm using pop up on the screen as I'm using them. And this is a technique that I used in the first video for watercolor beginners and got such great feedback on. So let's get into it. Here is the original painting that I did in the watercolor beginners video. And I'm gonna link that below as I mentioned. And we're gonna repaint this composition, but with all of the intersecting new techniques, whatever you wanna call them, that we've just gone through today. Let's recap. There are four details I want you to think about as you exit the beginner phase, become an ex-beginner, and enter into the intermediate phase of your watercolor journey. Number one, opacity. Start to think about how different personalities of watercolor are going to change what happens on the paper. Whether you're actually using a more opaque watercolor that has additives, or you're just using sheer watercolor but in heavier layers. Number two, wet on wet, but with multiple colors and layers. And of course, playing around with wet on wet and more opaque watercolor textures. Number three, wet on dry, but the same applies. I want you to have an experimental spirit with different colors, layering, and watercolor opacity with this technique. And number four, the most important, is the mingling of techniques. You have all these basics, you feel a certain comfort with them, but now you wanna compound on that. Build these techniques, see how different techniques work together. Wet on wet, but with line work, or wet on dry, but with dry brush. Wet on wet, but with contrast detailing. Glazing, but with a flooding technique to start. I mean, there are countless combinations. And this is where things get really interesting in your journey. Let's head into this painting. And just a helpful note at this point, friends, you may be feeling a little overwhelmed right now. And that's okay and honestly to be expected. Here's what I want you to remember. A lot of this compounding of techniques and intersecting and mingling of techniques happens in your gut. It happens in the instinctual moments in a painting and they're not really always the kind of thing that you can plan or think through completely. 
So just know that and just lean into the uncomfortableness you feel right now and pour that into the page and being instinctive. I know it feels scary, but you got this. Friends, up until this point, I'm establishing the basic composition. I'm keeping an eye on the original painting, making sure that I'm getting enough of a similarity here, and primarily using wet on wet with multiple colors either on the page or on my brush at the same time. Just a note to remind you that the mingling or compounding of watercolor techniques doesn't or shouldn't happen during all stages of your painting session. Sometimes it's just the beautiful basics. 
it's important to say here, friends, that there is definitely a gray area with some of these intermingling of techniques. So where we just painted on that big central leaf, is it line work? Is it glazing? The answer is yes, but it's not really knowing the exact name and when the perfect time is to use the name of that technique, no. It's really just knowing that this arsenal of magical moments is available to you when you just realize how these techniques play with one another, how they shake hands, how they high five, right? <laughs> so don't worry too much about the naming, just know that all of this fun playfulness exists. Now you're really ready to step up your game. And I think the next best thing that you need to take a look at is how you're holding your brush. So I have a video here on brush handling that's really important and you need to watch it next because it's going to give you so much more happy painting on this wild, wonderful watercolor journey. Until next time.